Um, as Mark said, I'm Adam Tikal. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research um, here at the University. Um, that will mean nothing to almost everybody in the room. Um, what it means is that it's my job to make sure that, or to do everything I can do to make sure that Birmingham is one of the, the world's leading research universities. And um, so I kind of sit on top of all the academics that you'll be taught by, um, cracking a whip every now and again and trying to um, ensure that we meet the aspirations that we have for a university so that you can continue to be taught um, by world-leading um, academics. And, and that's something we place great store by, is the relationship between um, a great education and great researchers. And, I'm, and I hope that you've got a flavour of that this afternoon and will continue to enjoy that for the rest of your time while you're here. Um, so, um, clearly the, uh, the Great Read at Birmingham uh, is Mark's book about evolution um, and the history of evolution, and Mark will be talking about that later on in the term. Um, but one of the things that I just want to stress for a moment is that Charles Darwin himself was a very, very shy, um, retiring guy who spent most of his time after writing um, or on the origin of the species um, at his country, well, country home. Um, he didn't go out and fight for the, for the ideas that he, was, he so powerfully articulated. Um, and in the, in the rough and tumble of Victorian society where ideas were really in flux, this was a very important, uh, this was a very important gap. And in many respects, he left the fighting over his ideas to, um, to his confederates. And the most important one of his confederates was a guy named um, Thomas Henry Huxley, who some of you might have heard of. And Huxley was, was um, so, uh, uh, probably so um, ambitious and so... Um, angry about the way he argued, this, argued for Darwin's ideas, he was known as Darwin's bulldog. And he very famously had an encounter with the Bishop of Oxford in 1860 when there was a debate about um, the truth or not of um, evolutionary theory as opposed to, um, to, create, to the creation story in the Bible. Um, and the Bishop of Oxford, um, you might have heard of this, uh, said to him in what was a very witty put down, so are you descended from an ape on your grandmother or your grandfather's side? Um, the story about that, that story may or may not be true. Um, you will certainly, if you read this, you'll read it in, in the textbooks, and you'll certainly, it's all over the web that it's true. I think uh, Mark knows a lot more about this than I do, um, but Mark's, uh, Mark's research suggests that it isn't true, although it's one of those stories that gets repeated, and that's, I think, one of the consistent things that you'll learn over your time as a student here, is that you shouldn't always believe things you're told, not even if they're by, um, but in the textbooks, or not even if they're by people who are standing up on the podium like I might be as well. Whatever the truth of that, though, um, Huxley himself was a very, very remarkable person. Um, he left school at the age of 10 after two years of formal education. Um, he was a voracious reader, and through that he taught himself um, science, philosophy, um, history, and through the books he also taught himself German. Um, I'm not suggesting that you go away and think, well, I can, go and, uh, I can give up my degree, um, save myself a few thousand pounds and read my way into, into history. Um, but, but Huxley did manage to do that. Um, he was an adventurer and a medic, and he spent uh, time as a surgeon's mate on a, on a boat uh, named the HM, HMS Rattlesnake, um, and that surveyed Northern Australia and New Guinea. Um, he, proved, he proved himself an expert on invertebrate comparative biology, and he authored several papers that clarified things, um, taxonomy that wasn't understood at the time. Um, in 18, 1854, he became professor of natural history um, at what was then the Royal College of Mines and is now part of the Imperial College um, London. Um, and for over 30 years, he made a series of um, very, very wide-ranging contributions to science and education in Britain. Um, his achievements include his classification of um, of birds with dinosaurs, um, something that really has only recently been understood um, to be true. And in fact, you'll have seen in the last week or so, um, there, were discovery of, there was discovery of dinosaur feathers that have been preserved in amber. Um, really, really interesting. If you haven't seen the photographs of it, they're definitely worth, uh, worth Googling. Um, he also wrote a treatise on the physical, physical geography of the Thames Valley, um, a book which um, I understand from Mark is a classic book on, on crayfish, and a biography of the Scottish philosopher David Hume. So he was a true polymath. Um, he helped to secularise schools, he opened up adult education, um, and he, uh, he was a great 
um, uh, advocate of changing in the universities so that universities became factories of new knowledge rather than storehouses of old. Um, he coined the word agnostic, and he left, a whole, uh, left behind him a whole series of aphorisms, some of which were passed into the um, contemporary English language. Um, so he said things like, uh, after all, it's respectable, it is as respectable to be modified ape as to be modified dirt. Um, he said science is organised common sense. Um, and he, he said that the great tragedy of science is the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact, um, which, which is a very nice thing to say, but also it's, it is the very nature of the way that science works, is that however elegant your theories are, if there are facts that get in the way, then the facts are the things that have to take priority. Um, so why am I talking so much about Huxley? Um, there are three or four reasons. And first of them is that Huxley is, understanding Huxley in relation to Darwin is really important if you want to understand the history of ideas. Um, great ideas, um, such as the theory of evolution, um, need to be argued over. They, the comments, they don't enter the common sense unless there are people who will argue for them and fight, them in, fight their battles um, at the appropriate moments. Victorian society in England was by no means receptive um, to an explanation of life on Earth that didn't rely on, on God. Um, and Huxley's advocacy of Darwin was powerfully influential. And in many respects, it was an advocacy that Darwin himself wasn't prepared to make because his wife was herself um, a devout Christian and he didn't really want... He, there, were, there was a limit to what he wanted to argue. Um, second, and more parochially, um, Huxley is important to the history of the university that you've come to study at. Um, although the university here on this campus dates back to 1900, um, its predecessor was, um, was based where the Birmingham Central Library now is, and it was the, something called the Mason Science College. And the college was founded in 1875 by a Birmingham industrialist and philanthropist um, called Sir Jos Josiah Mason. Um, uh, Mason had made his fortune selling pens and uh, key rings and things like that. Um, and Mason College had a series of important alumni, including uh, uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, Nobel Prize winner Francis Aston, and, and a variety of other people. And it was Chamberlain that went on, who went on to found the University of Birmingham. Um, but the, the key reason for, for, point, for, say, for pointing all of this out is that Huxley... Um, laid the foundation stone for Mason Science College in 1880. Um, so there's a direct link between this university and Darwin's Bulldog. And it's a link that's commemorated still to this day um, with a lecture that the whole the university holds in Huxley's honour um, and this tradition that's gone back for well over a century. And if you've seen the, the Aston Webb building, um, the, Victorian, the splendid Victorian red brick building in the semicircle, um, we have a statue of up above the entrance is a statue of Charles Darwin um, amongst the, the great uh, people that the university pays homage to. Um, and Huxley, when Huxley opened the University uh, Science College, he gave a speech on the topic of science and culture, um, a speech which continues to make interesting reading today, although it is, I have to say, in somewhat arcane language. Um, but he, what he did in that speech was to argue that a scientific education was much more important than the classical one. And he poured scorn on subjects that he considered to be dead, um, like Latin, uh, English, the sorts of things that, I don't know how many of you are doing those today, the sorts of things that we teach proudly in this university today. Um, but he argued that a, a scientific education was what was essential to equipping uh, the modern student. Um, and my third reason for talking about Huxley is, is parochial uh, to the point of being very personal. And you'll have to uh, excuse me for that. Um, Huxley died in 1895. Um, he was a, not only a profligate uh, intellectual polymath, but he was somewhat profligate in terms of his personal life as well. Um, and he and his wife, Henrietta, had eight children. Um, like the Darwins, they lost a child in infancy, um, but their, their family turned out to be a very interesting family. Um, two of his daughters married the same man, uh, not at the same time, um, but the same man was um, pre-Raphaelite painter um, John Collier, who um, has paintings um, hanging in the Tate Gallery uh, and a variety of other galleries around the world. Um, he had a very eminent son, Leonard, and Leonard has six children um, by two wives. Let's see if you can see a pattern in the family history. Um, 
and his children, uh, Leonard's children included Julian Huxley. Um, Julian Huxley was an evolutionary biologist who was one of the founders of the World Wildlife Fund. Um, he was the first director of UNESCO, um, and some, in somewhat more unsavory light, he was a eugenicist, uh, which meant that he had he he carried forward Darwin's theory on species into the human into into the human race, and um, he he wrote about um, he had very unsavory views, to my mind, to modern thinking. Um, about the rate at which what he called the lower strata reproduced, and he was he advocated um, sterilisation of of working class people because they were reproducing at far greater rate than uh, than middle class intellectuals like himself. Um, Julian was the brother of Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World, um, one of the most influential novels of the 20th century, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, and their brother um, Andrew. Uh, won the Nobel Prize for his work on the physiology of nerves. So you have to, you can see this is a kind of scary family uh, that uh, you might be a part of. And then one of their, uh, one of Leonard's great granddaughters uh, married one of the, um, uh, one of the descendants of Charles Darwin. So the intertwining continued through the generations. Um, so as I said, Darwin, um, sorry, Huxley had eight children. Um, his eldest daughter, Jessica, survived scarlet fever when she was two years old, and this was what killed her elder brother, Noel. Um, and this is where, where you'll have to indulge me even further. Um, Jessica uh, married someone called Fre Frederick Waller, who was an architect uh, to the Dean uh, Gloucester Cathedral. Um, they had various, they had children, their children had children, uh, and their children had children, and this is where um, I come in because uh, Huxley was my great great grandfather, and I hadn't realised until about two months ago when Mark Pellin told me that Huxley had opened uh, opened the university. So I have to say it was a huge thrill for me because I suddenly felt an ownership of the institution uh, that I didn't have before. But I knew very much, but very little about my Huxley uh, family history as a child. And my abiding memory of my uh, my eldest Huxley Huxley uh, ancestor was my grandmother. And my abiding memory of my grandmother was twofold. Firstly, she brought me round to his fruit gums when she came round for Sunday lunch. And secondly, when we went round for Sunday lunch, we were at risk of being killed because she couldn't ch cook chicken. So it ran blood uh, out of the chicken, and the potatoes were so hard that uh, we tried to hide them uh, in any way we could do, including in our pockets and uh, under the plates and so on. Um, however, in the absence of fruit gums, and certainly in the absence of chicken, which is going to kill me, um, I'm very pleased, uh, in fact very honoured to, to have been able to come here and say a few words to kick off uh, the Great Read at Birmingham Initiative. I hope, you enjoy, I hope you've enjoyed the book and I hope you enjoy the event, events this week and over the rest of the term um, as, much as, as much as you should. And it would be very useful to get your feedback because as you probably know this is the first time we've done it. Um, and, and certainly the, the sense we have is it's a very good way of getting people from a wide range of different areas together um, to think and, and talk and hopefully get quite cross with each other. Um, so thank you very much. And um, I think Mark said that you can now uh, disappear. So.